In this episode, we're going to take a quick look at something I wish every zoo had, an aquarium. Locals of Michigan's John Ball Zoo have been blessed with an aquarium since 1960, even getting an updated one in 1995. The Living Shores comprises of seven unique sections that highlights the differences and similarities between temperate ecosystems found in the Western Hemisphere. Before we dive right into things, if you haven't already, I would really appreciate it if you clicked that subscribe button to officially join our tour group. Then I want all of you to comment below what is one aquarium or zoo-based aquarium that deserves a feature on Zoo Tours. We're picking up exactly where we left off at the zoo's new Pygmy Hippo Pavilion, one of the best exhibits of its kind, and I want everyone to see this, so here is a link to it just in case you haven't. Now, in between the pygmies and the aquarium is where you can say hello to their bald eagles, who I can only assume are rescues. And their enclosure is great in more ways than one. You can view them from almost every angle, including one of the dining areas. First thing I did when I walked up to the aquarium building was admire the Pacific Northwest inspired artwork. The second thing I did, check out what was moving around in this pond, and it's alive with good sized trout. Now you can look at them, but there's just one rule. Keep the food and donations to yourself. Upon entry, there's a large detailed poster that reveals the three ecosystems that this aquarium focuses on. The second animal display is viewed from the inside, but it'll have you looking back to the outside at the Michigan Streams exhibit. The state has 36,000 miles of rivers and streams with 24 fish species, and there's no better way to talk about streams than actually creating one. It even falls and flows into the trout pond outside. The next section is entirely dedicated to the southern parts of South America, or otherwise known as the Patagonian region, or at least it used to be. The Patagonian Streams exhibit was converted into the Great Lakes, now home to the Lake Sturgeon, a living fossil equipped with bony backplates, four whisker-like barbels, a long snout, prehensile lips, and the females can be around for a century and a half. If you look up and around, you'll find that you're sharing the room with black crowned night herons. I'm afraid to admit they gave me a good scare, just like when people look at a still reptile and think it's a statue, because I really didn't expect this to be a walkthrough aviary. I mean, just look at the shot and tell me you wouldn't think the same thing. My favorite part, well, everyone's favorite part, is the penguin habitat, and not entirely because of the animals themselves. Like the Michigan streams, the educational display is more than just a bunch of words. This demonstrates how these penguins raise their young in burrows, even though they're just models. The only other way you're really going to see this is behind the scenes. I also love that it's open top for clear viewing, so you get that fishy smell in your nostrils and it lets you hear their songs. Some of you might be thinking, these are humble penguins, right? Didn't we just see these? No, you're smiling at Magellanic penguins. They look extremely similar, but here's how you can tell them apart. Geographically, Humboldt's live along South America's west coast. Magellanic penguins are mostly found on the continent's southern coasts, although a small part of their range does overlap. Both are in the genus of banded penguins and sport black lines on their chest. But Magellanics have a second band that goes across their neck. And if you look at their eyes, Humboldt have more exposed skin on their face. Now this is where Patagonia becomes the Pacific Northwest waters, an ecosystem rich with hundreds of fish, both fresh and saltwater. The few fish stayed in here in the deepest part of the crevice. The main viewing is a tight space, so if you can't ever really get your turn, just do a bit of backtracking, because that tank and the penguin pool are separated underwater by glass. If there's anything the Pacific Northwest waters are famous for, it's kelp forests an actual forest in the ocean. 
kelp is a kind of brown algae. One species can grow two feet a day, and not only does it provide food and shelter for thousands of animals, but it's also an ingredient in many of our everyday products. And I would love to tell you what they are, but I will save that for another exciting upcoming episode that also features a kelp forest. And now the last part of the Northwest and the aquarium is the tide pool room. But off to the side of the main display is a coastal tank that was once an octopus home a few years ago, but has since been taken over by a rock or otherwise known as a spiny lobster, which are not true lobsters. They do have spiny antennas, but they lack those large claws. The tide pool room is very similar to Patagonia, so I expected more birds, but it focuses more on the water itself. The tank draws in the water, releases it back into the habitat, and overflows into the visitor space, creating a tide pool. And I know that was short, but that will conclude another wild look at Michigan's John Ball Zoo. And when we return for round three, we will take that spotlight to their incredible and personable creatures from Africa. So as always, please stay tuned for the next adventure. Stay wild and thank you for watching Zoo Tours.